Uh, pretty interesting. I'm, I'm a fish breeder. Uh, named Steve Chester. I have a fish room of my own. Fish breeder. South American stuff. Um, why did I do this talk? Now, I'm of the opinion that when I'm sat at where you're sitting and I'm listening to a talk, there's certain subjects that can captivate a room and there's certain subjects on certain fish that only a portion of that room is interested in that talk. Talk on Rift Valley cichlids and interest in Rift Valley people. What I wanted is something that we could all get involved in Something, even if you're not a fish breeder or you don't have your own fish room, something we could all find interesting. I'd like plenty of questions. What a, another thing that I don't like about talks that I thought we could improve on is where the speaker up at the front barks on for an hour and a half, everybody's falling asleep, and he says, Thank you very much. And you wake up and you give him a clap, and off you go. There's plenty of questions that can be asked on a talk like this. Everybody must have questions. I've been in these fish rooms, I can't answer a lot of questions, there's some technical questions that I can't answer, but if you've got anything, you see anything that's of interest, shout it out and we'll see if we can help. Maybe discuss it between ourselves, it's, um, we can all learn, I'd like to learn something today, something that you noticed that I didn't notice. I've only spent a couple of hours in these rooms. We're going to have... I think there's four different fish rooms that I've visited over the last year, including my own, which I've done a step-by-step -step guide to how I built it up. And in between, I wanted a page where I could, it was an obvious gap between the two different, the different fish rooms, so you'll see a bit of a shameless plug for our BCA website. I thought it's as good as any, isn't it? So, right, Bolton Museum. Luckily, Mark and Ray and a few of the other fellas were, were friendly with Pete and um, Paul, Pete, uh, Paul Dixon, Pete Liptrop. Pete Liptrop was actually a chairman of the BCA at one stage. Trevor? Yeah, he was a chairman. Yeah, and he's both superb fish keepers, absolutely fantastic. Um, recently they've hit the headlines for breeding the first in the world to breed the Celestial Pearl Daniel, which is tiny fish from Myanmar that was found and they brought them over and within weeks of getting them into the UK they bred them. The rest of the world followed suit fairly quickly. They weren't difficult fish to breed but Practical Fish Keeping read them, carried the page and they got famous. They were, they were already famous in certain circles but they, they're well known fish keepers. Um, the room itself is completely free for the museum. Anybody can go down. It's a gorgeous old it's in the middle of the town centre. They've got the courts, the main police station, and the public museum. Uh, nice Egyptian displays and everything upstairs. Now below in the cellars, they've got in the basement, they've got this public aquarium. It's run by Paul and Pete, and it's really nice. You, know, you come in through the main doors, and down here you've got planted aquariums, four foot planted tanks, community tank fish, some pistol grammars, and a lot of the fish that we all keep at home. We come round, this is the hidden door that goes behind the scenes, which we'll take you behind in a minute, but we've got big public aquariums, Rift Valley cichlids, Central American cichlids, South American cichlids. It's all fresh water, they don't, a lot of public aquariums are only specialise in saltwater fish, not much of interest to me, but Paul and Pete, they do all fresh water, there's no marine, and they do a really good job. So, it's free to enter, different displays, I said we've got Rift Valley, gorgeous Rift Valley that's up there in this corner, Rift Valley. Piranhas, yeah, every public aquarium has piranhas I think. We've got two, feeding time's always fun. Pure cichlids, of course, Celestial Pearl Daniel. This was my first contact with Paul and Pete. When Practical Fish Keeping ran that page that this fish was newly discovered, it was in danger of being overfished. There was a big hoopla that they were catching that many that they were destroying the natural habitat. Now it came out in the, in the papers and the magazines that if you keep this fish, please try and conserve it, try and breed it. I felt lucky and picked up all males. Well, lucky in one respect, unlucky that I only got males. Paul and Pete, I sent them an email, they kindly sourced me some females. That was my initial contact with these guys. Very friendly. I was just average Joe off the street. 
send them an email, more than welcome to pick them up. We've got you, we'll go out of our way, we find them for you, come and pick them up. They have cichlids on display, tilapia, they have a nice display for educational purposes on food value of tilapia. Terracol Patroplius, the Madagascans, I think I said it right, I haven't really studied the Madagascans, but these are the first in the UK to breed this species. We'll keep, keep it going, conservation. There's a lot of conservation issues, they do a lot of that. Uh, Geophagus, Tapajol species redhead. These are actually donated by Andrew Wood, or some of the fish in the group were donated by Andrew Wood. So, and again, it's an instance of the hobby helping out the professionals and the professionals. They've actually bred these in the aquarium and they passed some back to Andrew. So Andrew is now on the second generation that they've passed back. So that's nice. Again, Bedial Chromis, really nice display. Always active, there's plenty of fry in the nooks and crannies, so they're obviously breeding in that time. Piranhas, again, feeding time. I don't know when they feed, but they must have a scheduled feed time. I'm sure the kids enjoy that one. Um, display, community with neon tetras, coral red pencil fish. Severums, I couldn't get a picture of the adults, but the actual adults had a brood of fry in the big display tank. They were guarding five, six hundred fry in this public display tank. Fascinating to watch. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a clear picture, so I took some later on in the back fish room uh, just to show the fish. Oh, behind the scenes, this is interesting. As I said, this go back a little bit. This little door here, you open that little hatch, and again, there's a big walkway right behind. I think I suppose Mark and Bay you've both been behind the scenes, have you? Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit closed shop. You can't just turn up on the day and expect to go behind. So I was lucky that they invited me behind and, and they agreed to let me take as many pictures as I wanted, really. They're really helpful. Right, there you go. As you can see, he's got all his tea around him. They didn't dress up for the occasion. In fact, they forgot I was on my way down, and so <laughs> it, was, it was a case of we'll carry on work and you just take as many pictures as you want. This is Paul, Paul Dixon. If anything, I've had a bit more contact with Paul than Pete. Um, spoke to Pete before, but this is the first time I've actually met him in person. Both stand-up guys, top actorists, real good, friendly people. As you can see, they were stood around talking all day, and I had to make them posed and looked like they were doing some work just so I could take some pictures. <laughs> Hence please expression. Now, yeah, the display tank. So as you come through that secret doorway, this is where you you're on a walkway all of a sudden and this is raised up, this is maybe three, four foot off the floor, so you come up the steps and you're on you're leaning over into the display tanks then in this and these concrete vats. Um, glass on the front at this end. And you're looking down into the fit into the display tanks. Now you come down through this way, down here, and the other fish room is down into the through this gap. There you go. Off the breast. Yeah. So lighting. Lighting is standard metal halides. Usually as cheap as possible. It's a free to enter public aquarium. So you've got to be mindful of the fact that the government funded or the council funded and they've also, they've also got to be careful with the costs. Um, something like this isn't cheap to run whatsoever. In, in fact, it's a, I can imagine it being a huge expense. Um, lighting, the metal halides, usually one's ample over these tanks. It's uh, more than enough. Water is pumped by two industrial sized units. I did want to add a video to the talk, but couldn't get it on and I didn't want to risk last night messing the whole lot up and, and trying to bodge it on so I haven't but I want the video to more to show the, the volume of noise in a place like this. It's huge. These pumps are whirring, there's bubbles, there's, there's water cascading down the filters, it's a real noisy active place. You, you really know you're in there when you're in there. It's not silent and serene and peaceful. It's a real working environment. So, you're on these walkways, obviously the fish are coming up to see you. It made me chuckle because I could imagine somebody on the other side really enjoying this display. And then I walk behind with my camera and all of a sudden the fish are paying me the attention and somebody on the other side is losing out. But, uh, filtration. 
was interesting for me because I, had, I envisioned big sand filters or big industrial size filters. And it's basically do-it-yourself trickle filters. They've got a lot of these boxes which are perforated on the bottom. Top row, the water is pumped up from, obviously the water movement is by these pumps. This rotates all the water around the fish room. And each individual has an outlet, which is much like the dual fish key, you know, the dual fish tanks. They've got the box in the corner, much like that. There's a box in the corner with a pump inside, pumps the water out, up, over the top, over the pipeworks, and just through the perforated pipework on the top. It's as simple as that. It really is a home aquarium on a bigger scale. It's filter floss, which is cleaned daily. Pete said he just lifts it out. Chucks it on the side, he's got a hose pipe, he'll hose the, hose the waste off the floss, that's fine. He'll put it back on, they'll get maybe two weeks out the same piece of floss, so it's too rancid and, and they'll stop and start again. Biological media, I've mostly missed one off, there's two, there's two layers of biological media. Again, underneath there's a bigger biological media, this isn't taking out physical waste, but it's, it's cleans in the water, taking all the nitrates out, ammonia, and then it just cascades down off the bottom. I hope that isn't my phone. <laughs> I told the missus not to ring. <laughs> so, now, where's we go? As I said, this walkway, this down, this is down on floor level, and then this way you, you go down a corridor, and you're now into the main fish room. Now this is the bit I was interested in. These guys, are, as well as running a public aquarium, they're actually fish breeders. They, they breed a lot of fish. They're not specialists in cichlids, killifish, tetras. They'll do the whole lot. If, the, if it's new, they've got it and they're breeding it. If it's old, they've got it and they're breeding it. It's a, they're not fussy. They do a lot of conservation work, but they're also breeding standard aquarium fish, uh, emperor tetras. There's big plenty. Remember, it's a public aquarium. There's big tanks with X display fish on or new display fish that they're quarantining. It. It's a real mixture of fish. Uh, you come through the door here. It's a, it's a U shape. The, the rooms, that fish rooms, are really awkward to photograph. Unless it's a huge open plan room, they're really, usually they're on a tight angle. You can't get a full idea of the actual layout of the fish room unless you're above. It's so it's all in stages. Now this way from the door, you're going in, you've got the fish, you've got the sink. Now the, the main problem with this many fish tanks is sterilization, passing one disease from another tank to another. So these guys, they're just using hot water. They've got a thermostat on the wall, they'll keep the temperature to maybe 35, 40 degrees, and they'll just boil everything. They'll boil a bucket, a bucket of hot water nets in there, any substrate that they're not using at that time. Everything's sterilised before it's moved into the next place. They're really careful about cross-contamination um, and so on. As you come through the door, come back down this way, you've got the, this, it's about 6 by 3 by 3 I think, it's under a hell of a lot of water. That's the fresh water the supply, it's pumped up for water changes. It's, I think all fish rooms have a fresh water supply, this is theirs. They'll, they use mainly tap water, they will alter water, but on a volume of fish this size, it's, it's almost impossible to supply as much RO as you need or whatever. A lot of the fish may do with what they can give them, part of a specialist breeding job, so, and they, they know what they're doing, they, they breed whatever they can get basically. Now to the left, the, the, to the right hand side of this sink, there's another sink, this is where the action takes place. All fish rooms, breeders fish rooms, wild food. It's, um, it's, it's the heart of a fish room, in my opinion, it's heart, the heart of a breeder's fish room, is his fish food. Now, if you're bringing a, a tiny, tiny fry on from that size to a full-grown adult in three months, they need a lot of food. Live food is the, really the only one that can supply the nutrition to get the best quality results. And these guys are vinegar eels, they've the culture vinegar, all these can be fat. I point my laser at your mark, but I've been warned not to get in people's eyes. <laughs> it's like buying a lightsaber when you buy one of these. So, yeah, vinegar eels, they'll all, they all be found on Mark's table. Anybody can try them, anybody can culture them at home. It's just 
a home culture kit on a bigger scale. They use sweet jars for brine shrimp, constantly four, five on the go. And an interesting tip for you, what I, I, I have a space-heated fish room. You go in my fish room and you know about it. You don't go in with your coat on because it's roasting. 85, 90 degrees. Everything in that fish room then is 85, 90 degrees. I can hatch brine shrimp out just in the room temperature, just by setting it up. In a cooler room, what you can struggle with is getting a fast hatch on your brine shrimp. What these guys do, you sit it in this tray, the four, there's one that's just being drained off there, you can see it's settled, settled out, eggs at the top, brine shrimp on the bottom. What they do to keep it warm, they'll just periodically, they're in there all day basically, the, 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 the workplace. They'll top this up with warm water every so often. While I was there, they inadvertently boiled the water too high, turned it up and killed all the brine shrimp for the day. <laughs> it's one of them, it's, a, it's an accident that happens. But that's a good method if you're doing it at home and if you're doing it in your kitchen and it's not warm enough to get a fast hatch on your brine shrimp, sit in a small tank, heat the tank up with an external, with a heater in that tank, warm the water up, sit your brine shrimp hatch in. Bob's your uncle, you've got space heated, you've, your brine shrimp's up to 80 degrees and you get a nice fast hatch on it. As well as the brine shrimp, which all the smaller fish get, you've also got infusoria, which is tiny, tiny, microscopic. You virtually can't see them, like dust in the water. You give that to your young fish, young egg scatterers, tetras, barbs, gasbladers. It's an essential first food. These guys culture it in vast amounts. Um, just green water, basically keep it topped up and there's always a constant life. As you can see, it's not the cleanest and tidiest of areas, but this fish room itself is 40 years old. It's, and these guys have been working there for about eight, nine years. And they, they, they do well, they do really well. It's a nice, nice setup. Uh, now as you come round the corner, so you come round this door, the sink's in this corner with the brine shrimp, you come back round this way. So this is a huge, this is a bank in the middle of tanks, and this is the actual bank. Six on each row, so you've got six, twelve, eight, eighteen, and you, you've got twenty-four tanks on there. Same again on the other, forty-eight tanks, and there's a few that have crammed, crammed in at the top, and there's a few bigger ones down at the bottom. Again, that's a six by two by two. These are all two, two foot by one foot by one foot, so they're not huge tanks. They're just manageable. These are breeding tanks, um, stock tanks. When they're growing the fry on, quite often they'll breed the egg scatterers, they'll take the pears out and they'll just leave the fry in these tanks here to grow on. You look at some of them, my lad's first in, my lad's first impression, oh it's a mess, it's a real mess that place, it's a dump. It's not, it's, it's looks untidy but I have yet to see a tidy fish room, it's, it's a workplace, it's, and these guys are the best, there's fry in all these tanks, the tanks are absolutely coming out the sides. The, do a really good job. Ventilation if they need it. Um, heating. The essential. But yeah, that picture shows it a little bit better. I asked them about the heating because obviously the tropical fish room has got to be tropical temperatures. Now you've got two options. You can heat the tanks individually. Now the cost of spec buying 70 heaters and running 70 heaters in a cold room, it's, it's a no brainer. In the UK with our electricity bills, it's you can't do it basically. It's so what they got on most fish keepers or professionals or semi professionals, they'll heat the room, they'll insulate well and they'll heat the room. Luckily for these guys, they don't pay the electricity bill and they're in the basement. It's nice, fairly warm anyway, stable temperature. And the whole museum, the museum heating for the whole museum that's above it runs through the basement. So these pipes are constantly pumping hot water around which keeps the room at a nice stable, 75, 80 degrees, it's perfect. They don't need to, so they're not looking for, they're not heating individual tanks, everything is just, in these tanks there's just a filter. Basically that's it, filter, decor and the fish. They're not, they're not elaborate setups, they're not, but they do the job and they do it well. Professional fish breeders, as I said, it's, um, it's a living for these guys, they get the conservation jobs, they, maintain things, they, they pass fish on to other fish keepers and hey, it's a, they keep things going. So the, the fish breeders, they are actually professional fish breeders. What I thought I'd do is photograph some of the fish keeping paraphernalia. Now that to everybody else would just be a tub of marbles 
to me, that's where they breed the egg scatterers. They'll lay bottom of the tank full of marbles, the fish will spawn over the top, and because the fish are so keen to eat their own eggs, the eggs will settle into these marbles and straight away it's the, the guarded, the fish can't get down into the eggs and they can't eat their, they can't eat their own eggs, which they quite often will. If you set a pair of egg scatterers up in a bare tank, no sooner as they finish spawning, they're eating their own eggs because in the wild the stream would carry them off downstream and they'd never see them again in their life. In a tank, it's their own free food. These guys use marbles, they use other methods as well. Because they do a lot of egg scatterers, they, they have a tank like this. It's a big industrial size unit, but it's sitting with these lips here. It's designed to sit in a three foot tank. Sit halfway, there'll be a gap on the bottom. This will sit inside the tank. There's all these holes drilled in the tank. And the fish will breed perfectly naturally in a nice sized tank. And as they're breeding, the eggs are falling through these gaps out the same, out of harm's way. When the fish are finished, they'll lift this tray out, put it to one side, put the breeders back in the tanks, in the stock tanks, and they'll leave the eggs in the three foot tank that just been spawned in and raise them all up together. It's, there's a couple of methods that I thought I'd pick out as the ways that they try and save the eggs and egg scatterers and stuff like that. Because as sickly breeders, we're really lucky really lucky that I can leave a tank of dwarf cichlids together for, with the fry for two months and they'll guide them around the tank and they'll, all the kinds of fish are predatory of their own eggs and this is what they do to Now this really got my attention. You notice on every tank that they, they'll tag water changes and they list all the water changes, date in so when them fish go in these are Epistogram and Agassiz. I, don't, I didn't see them in the tank, but they were actually donated by me to the thing, so it was interesting to see that one, because I took some of them down just after Christmas when I went to see them for the first time. Um, this is an idea that I've, as I said, we can always learn from somebody else. I'm constantly learning. I'd, I'd give up this hobby tomorrow if I wasn't learning. I've now spent money on the laminator. You'll see it in the bell. I've actually made my own up of these because I do each individual tank by hand and it was often hard, not so much water changes because I do water changes regular, regular enough to remember the last one but my filter changes, quite often I'll be in my fish room and I'll think oh well, when was that filter done? Oh, was it three weeks, was it four weeks and you pull it out of the tank and it's, there's that much dirt in it, it's, it's really heavy and it could have been two months since you last did it, the mine's not too everybody's mind is permeable in what it retains so I, I took on this and I've put tags on my fish tanks now and it allows me with a marker to mark when I've done the water change and when I've done and it neatens things up and it's made my life already it's made it considerably easier. Feeding, he took me on a guided tour around the fish room and uh, when I asked him about feeding obviously it's on a grand scale these guys have got I think it's two dozen big public aquaria to look after, plus all the small. We see the feeding for the small fish in the fry and the, with the live foods. Now they also feed cockles, prawns, mussels, dead fish. How long this tub had been in there, I, I've got no idea. It's certainly not food grade. <laughs> if you look at the grey colour on the shrimp, that soon tells you that. But the carnivorous fish, the piranhas, the most probably certain other ones, they, they relish this stuff. And interestingly enough, because of the food bill, what they do, they go to the markets, they go to, and they get second stuff that isn't human grade, and they'll quite often be donated stuff off the market, so they go to the fish market and see what's left over at the end of the day. Wormery, they have all the way along the boardwalk, behind the public aquariums, they have their own wormeries where tea bags are donated, vegetable peelings, they have worms being processed naturally, where they just pick out a handful, chuck them in the nearest tank. Bob's your uncle, free feeding. Um, <laughs> now, I hadn't seen this. And as we were walking along, he said, we feed an awful lot of fruit. So I'm fair enough, I heard a cucumber being fed and uh, I had three of my plex cucumber. He mentioned tomatoes. And my instant reaction is you cut a tomato, it makes a mess of your words off. The juices, the, the goo in the middle. So I asked him the question, does it, does it affect your water quality? He said, no, it's, uh, the only problem we have, 
the tomato seeds. <laughs> and sure enough, every so often along this public aquarium, you've got some small tomato plants cropping up everywhere. It's, it's a weird thing, it's, it's weird to see, but you'll see in another picture, a bit further down, but there's a fish tank in the fish room itself that's virtually turned into a vegetable filter. On top of one of these DIY filters, they've had that many tomato seeds in there. It's just covered across the top, the roots are dangling down. Super, best filter you could ever wish for, I think. You've never had a water quality issue in the lives. So he's really enthusiastic about it. So, I thought I'd put this in, I only did a couple of days ago, I was thinking, what else? We've got all these photographs and everything else, what else can we use? And I'll let you read that yourself, but the gist of it is, there's a list there. And that is what they feed. Now, that amazed me. That really amazed me. I'll give you a minute, let you read through it. And can everybody see it? Is that chopped up? That's what I asked. That's what I asked. Yeah, they'll chop it up. A lot of it. Everybody got it. A lot of it sourced. It amazed me. I couldn't believe that they fed that much. Obviously, we all heard of cucumber. I've heard it. I've read discus books. Discus feed naturally yeah. in the wild off fallen fruit. It makes perfect sense. All the fish do Yeah, and that's what he said. He said. That I said, which fish do you give it to? Pakus and stuff like that. He said, no, everything, literally everything. We'll chop it up. If it's so, they'll go to the market and if, it, if they've got a bad box of cherries or something like that, they'll take them back and they'll just chuck them in. The fish will literally revert back to natural state. It's what they do in the wild. We haven't got any people chucking fish, handfuls of fish food in. And I just couldn't believe just the volume of food that they, and he said there's trays and they, they, they finish it. The main problem again is the seeds and the stones and the bits that are non digestible. Um, and with the filtration that they've got, we don't tend to have any problems at all with water quality or anything else. There we go. <laughs> you can see the roots, the roots come down here along the cover glass, they're going up along that, all the way along, dangling down. I should imagine if that light was left on 24-7, you might even get a few cherry tomatoes off it for the dinner and look at the canteen. But again, he said he hasn't, it, it's literally that full now that they don't even bother cleaning the floss out, it's self-regulating. That filter hasn't been touched for well over eight months. And below it, there's um, an alligator gar, there's a big display alligator gar, um, plec, common plec, somebody's kindly donated. <laughs> Shall we all see in there? Well, uh, there in the end, these are a few fish, these are actually on display at the front, uh, Corridorus whites with eye, again, not many of these were being bred a few years back, they were amongst the first that were breeding these fish again, Better Rubra, again, lost to the hobby for over 100 years in Asia, there was political troubles and everything else and it was physically lost to the, the fish were still there in the natural habitat, they weren't available in the hobby. As soon as they were available in the hobby, these guys got them first wilds in. They've been breeding them ever since. Tim, they put them through your auction, don't they? Paul quite regularly comes down, brings a few to the auction. I've had better rubric off him. In fact, my visit in the just after Christmas was just after your auction. I've lost a female and I went down they kind of gave me another female to come with the mail. Um, so they're a nice fish. Natural habitats, they'll try and replicate the habitat of the fish as much as possible. Leaf litter, again at the beginning of the year when I was down, this was solid leaves and they've not cleaned them out, they broke down naturally. As you can see they're in little bits, a bit of java fern, pots that I did. Quite regularly, these are mouth brooding better. Um, Quite regularly, there'd be four or five different males mouth brooding in these tanks. And they're just left near enough in a natural state, feed, water change, but they're, they're left alone and they do their own thing. Now, Ray and Mark might give me a hand with this one. I'm convinced they've done a little bit of experimental crossbreeding with these, M. Protectors and Lacortii. Some look like M. Protectors and others look the spitting image of Lacortii, but they're all in the same tank. And as far as I can remember, when they were breeding them last time, he did tell me they were experimenting with, with different crosses and whether they, they're not irresponsible with it, they won't pass them back out into the hobby. 
one like they'd be pulled or kept on display. But this is the kind of work that they do. They do a lot of very closely related fish. These are the guys that will try to breed them. And if they breed, they can work out the taxonomical status of these fish and pass the information on to other people who are well up on that sort of stuff. Experimental, they do a lot of this kind of work. Severums, again, these are in the big six foot by two foot by two foot tank and they've got hundreds of them, absolutely hundreds. And, they, and they've spawned again in the main tank outside and he's, he's scr left scratching his head on what, what he does with so many Severums. It's, <laughs> it's a uh, Cats 22. He helps out a lot of local fish shops with these. Um, he goes to other displays, things like that. Now this, to me, this, this fascinated me and this really got me interested in what they do at Bolton. They work a lot with the local children. Now if you look at the average age of us like here, there isn't that many coming through in the next generation. Mark, you've got your two kids. I can see a couple of young ones over here, which is great to see. But after that, where do we go from there? There's not many coming through in the hobby as general, on the internet or anything else, we're all middle-aged to the older generation. There isn't a lot coming through. Now these guys really put it out there and as part of their day job, they've got to go, they go to schools, they do a lot of work with classes coming into the public aquarium, they go and give talks, they go to, people come to them for talks, they give them guided tours. And look at this, this is the Madagascan tank and as we're on the other side and we're looking down and Paul's explaining that there's a leak somewhere, hence the low level of the tank. He said there's a leak in the silicon, we're going to have to do this. And he's explaining. And these kids come along and look at the faces, they're, they're fascinated. I, personally, at my, when I was there, I'd have moved somewhere like that to go after school, free of charge, don't have to charge. I'd have been in the absolute elements here. And it's these things that I feel that the BCA especially has a role to play in encouraging these youngsters even more to carry on the good work that these are doing with schools and everything else. I think it's it's critical really if we want the hobby to continue. And not just the hobby, it's an industry as well. It's We're all hobbyists here, but it's an industry as well. We're lagging behind some of the other countries. And maybe these guys are the generation that can carry on after us, not. It's the end of that one. We'll go on to the next one in a minute. Is there any questions on that? Has anybody got anything? Very good. Excellent. Nobody? Anybody? Right? I think the way to look for people is an organised chaos. Organised chaos. Very good description, Ray. Yeah, we're all like that, aren't we, mate? If you'd have seen my fish room at 7 o'clock this morning after I finished packing up 40 lots down here, it was, yeah, more than a <laughs> disorganised chaos. <laughs> but, yeah. Anybody? Anybody else? Big fish room like that, no questions? Yeah, back to the fruit. Yeah? It intrigues me. Yeah, it intrigued me as well, <laughs> as a fish keeper. When you say they just dump the fruit in, do they chop it up and drain it? Or, and no, kill no. Everything that's what in. amazed me. The, the juices, the whole lot goes into the system. Because every, everything you eat tells you. Obviously, it's a, it's a balanced system. You can't just chuck a crate full of cherries in and expect oh, the yeah, filter yeah. to cool. Obviously, you know that, I know that. We'd all know that as sensible fish keepers. You can't just chuck a handful of fish food in and expect your filter to cool. But in moderation, yeah, that's what they're doing. That's, it amazed me, Dave. It really did. It me, though. It, and a lot of it's past its sell by date, a lot of it's non food grade. So it's, we wouldn't eat it, they wouldn't sell it. The market, it's, it's stuff off the market that's been there for maybe two days and it's going soft. And you know, when you buy a bunch of cherries I, or something, I'd be so scared of polluting the water. I would, I would, exactly the same. I need that was my question, and that's why I put it in here because it was it's something that intrigued me. I learned something new that day with that. That's why I brought it down here today because I thought, hoping that it made you think, it made me think. I tried to smile at the point, it did turn the water a little bit yellowish. It did, yeah, yeah. What about bacteria? Again, I did, the, the, he reported no problems whatsoever. He said it was it was just perfectly natural, it was just another part of it. It's a balanced diet, they don't just give the fish fruit, it's part of, like I said, there's the earthworms and a lot of fish are omnivores that will eat a bit of everything really. It's good, it's very good. Maybe, maybe they, maybe they don't. I think they just, if they've got it, maybe they'll squash it. I don't know. Maybe they, if you 
got a cherry and it's still got the tough skin on it, you'd, you'd think it'd be hard for the fish to eat that skin, get past the skin, maybe they squash it and then chuck it in. Worth experimenting with, it's really worth experimenting. I haven't done it yet, but I haven't had time since I went there and then preparing the talk and doing the auction. I haven't had a lot of time to have a go with my own fish, but I will do. And the sort of fruits grow naturally where the fish live anyway. Mangoes, passion fruits, you get all sorts, similar foods, yeah, similar foods. Yeah, fruit. oh, yeah. <laughs> Haiko Blair, in his new discus book, he's got a full ch chapter on fish foods. In the wild, the wild discus, 95% of the dietary intake of wild discus is fruit based. It makes a mockery of beef heart, giving them beef heart. I've never been one for giving fish beef heart because it's an unnatural diet. But Judging off what Haiko's found in stomach reporting, that's the natural diet. Fruit falling from the trees and stuff, not beef and, and I imagine angel fish will be much the same. Tetras, barbs, the, the, the tetras are the types of fish that feed on the off. As, you, as your biggest cichlids are eating and the particles are coming off that, the tetras are the fish that are diving in. So if you chop it up finely enough, I, I should imagine that they're going to take it. Why freeze uh, spinach? Into yeah. a large block, yeah. and then scrape it with a knife, and then I'll feed it my food so they get my food. Super, and then, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's something I don't give enough of, it's a green diet, it's, a, it's all meaty, live brine trim, live white worm, grindle worm. It's, yeah, it's something that I'm definitely going to experiment with. I put myself two days off after this talk, and I'm going to put my things up, and I might well just start chucking a bit of fruit in on Monday and Tuesday. Yeah, we'll all be asking for off-cuts at the market. How big, are, how big are the filters compared with the tanks? Pardon? How big are the filters compared with the tanks? Because that, that may be a key issue. The filters are big, but they're not huge. It's surprising. But did you, you seen them? I'm not I, I can't flick all the way back through. But you seen the DIY filters on the bigger tanks that I guess I didn't ask for the amount of volume of water in the tanks. But I guess it's the tanks are eight foot by five foot by five foot. The huge tanks, huge volume of water. Um, the filters aren't. They're in proportion to what your home aquarium would be. I think with a big. We've got a couple down there. Big external filter on a four foot tank, it's in comparison, size difference in the comparison, it's a similar sort of setup. Yeah, except, except they're using wet and dry, aren't they? They're like, using wet and dry, yeah, they trickle the water, which, through, make it which is a superb filter, yeah, we should all be on them if it was practical, but you can't set them up over your tank in the living room, can you? Unfortunately. Depends on how you do it. But yeah, my missus wouldn't be happy, no matter how I did it. <laughs> yeah, if you single, yeah. Well, a chance to be a fine thing. I wouldn't have a couch. <laughs> oh, what, what, one of the tanks I've got has got a, um, it's only about a four inch wide filter which sits on the ba along the back edge of the tank. Oh yeah, an aqua one by any chance? No, this is a, this was a one that was made up. It's a glass, a glass. Oh right, oh yeah, so, yeah. Full, a full custom made tank. Full, yeah. full, well, no, this was made extra. You just, it's just a four-inch square yeah. glass, and it sets up. I had a similar one in an aqua one tank, and my main gripe as a hobbyist, and it was too much hard work for the for the house. I was see these guys; it's a living for them. I don't, I don't know your situation. For me personally, changing the floss every single day, otherwise it just backed up and overflowed over the tree. We it's don't need, too much work for You this don't need to if you use a, you use a, you use a, a, gra a gravel medium or something in, along the length yeah, of it. Yeah, it's, I've got a, it's not, The one I've got is on a four foot tank. So you have a gravel medium for most of them and you just clean yeah, it out, final clean, clean, out. With, yeah. final, final clean with the, with the floss, which doesn't need... There's, there's a reason one way to do it, I think. And we're all different in how we approach our filtration. I'm sure everybody agree on that. Some are not internal, some are trickle, some are, some are better than others in different situations. I'll, I'll speak to you later about that one, but I won't get into it on this talk. <laughs> we'll get sidetracked a bit too much, I think. Right, my mate Dave, you use me laser on you. <laughs> no, he's a good, I've spent a lot of time in this fish room. It's, um, we built them almost at the same time, didn't we? Both realised we were struggling for space. Both had the same general idea on how we monitored the rooms, and there was a lot of toing and throwing with ideas and everything else. And we, it was nice that we built them both together really, it was a nice, uh, 
It wasn't a joint project because I didn't help him with him, he didn't even help me with mine, but we both struggled on regardless, didn't we? And uh, there you go, he's a breeder of angel fish, South American dwarf cichlids, and at the minute, specialising in his angels, domestic and um, wilds, just got some nice wilds going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, Dwarf cichlids, but he's not doing too many. He's not putting all his eggs in one basket like I do and do a bit of everything. He's doing cacatoides, he's specialising in cacatoides. He does a few others, mainly cacatoides, and uh, got them going pretty well at the minute, haven't you? It's, uh, yeah, it's a nice little setup. Wooden racks, again, this is a private breeder, just in somebody's back garden in the UK. Could be anywhere, could be your next door neighbour. If you see him staggering out of his shed at 11 o'clock at night, sweating, He's also got a fish. Actually, here. two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> On a good day. Yeah, where should we start? We'll start with Dave himself. Not again. Is, can you look busy while I take a fish tank there for a picture? Because usually he's just leaning on his, uh, you know, his elbow in his fish room. But no, he, does, he puts a lot of hard work in. Um, stock tanks up the top. He's got some angel fish and some breeding tanks with angel fish in. Uh, Further down, dwarf cichlids, a few angels, you can see one sticking out the corner there. These are nice sized tanks, I've always envied him for these ones. They're a three foot by two foot across, so it's real nice footprints in them. They're, they're in anybody's fish room, they're the handy sized tank, are they? They're really good volume of water for growing out fly. Dave's utilising some of them at the minute for actually breeding his fish. When he's got the harem spawning, he'll put one male in with three or four females, and they'll quite often have four or five broods of fish in the same tank, being guarded naturally as the epistogrammers do it. It's a fascinating way to keep your fish, and one that I wish I'd do a bit more. I know you've said that before, Mark, haven't you? You like to harem spawn the epistos a bit more. I'd like the space. Exactly. Yeah. That's it, that's what I'm saying. These tanks here are the ideal size for that, and that's how Dave does some of his cacatoids. And it's fascinating. You could sit and watch them tanks and how they raise the fry up all day long. So mine's a bit clinical in, in, in comparison to that. And again, more smaller epistogrammatory breeding tanks. They don't need a big tank, you can breed them in these smaller tanks. And down at the end, we have a rack here. He's got killifish. Which he got from Tim's auction at the beginning of the year, was it? Yeah. And got them going really well. We put a wall and spawning mop on every night, well, as part of his routine, squeeze the mop out, and the fish are natural, they spawn in these mops. Bob's your uncle, Bob's your uncle, you're picking eggs out of these mops. It's a, it's a fascinating form of fish keeping. There you go, I thought I'd list a few of his fish. These are the wilds he's got going really well, aren't they? They're a different quality, if you, I think they are, I think they're far better fish. As much as I love the domestics and I appreciate all the hard work that goes into the domestics, I really do. See, that, that to me, it's absolutely, it's a glorious picture, I love that one. Um, you're going, you've got fry, fry there. These are grow out tank, you see, it's producing could produce more, you could run out tank space, haven't you? It's well, these things with angel fish, more. yeah. But, um, you could do with it. You build a big fish room, and then suddenly you decide it's, it's not big enough and you need to extend it. Cacatoides, again, this is his natural harem spawning tank. This is the alpha male. He'll have several, these are the offspring, but these are smaller females that are eventually will breed. They'll take a smaller territory within the males. They'll take over, they'll defend a 12 by 12 spot, they'll breed in there, and you can get four or five in the same tank, and they guard in their own territories. Fascinating form of cichlid keeping. Um, using the bigger tanks again allows those to do that. No problem, did everybody hear that? The chef's going home in 10 minutes, so if you do want anything to eat, get to the bar now. And uh, is that cups of tea as well, Tim? Yeah. yeah, cups of tea, everybody wants to stop up. Soft drinks are still on, yeah, the bar's, the bar's still open, just, just catering. Yeah, I'll have a cup of tea then. Did he take that as a joke? <laughs>
And <laughs> um, right, bit of the setup with Dave's fish room. And um, I, in all my wisdom, decided to go for a clear roof on my fish room. Dave went with a solid roof. I'll talk a bit about mine later on, but further down the line, maybe six, seven months, something like that, decided he could do with a bit more lighting. Got a bargain of the sense, he's a jammy sock. Go on eBay. He's the only person who can get three or four double glazed windows. For what did you pay for? 99p. 99p. Jesus. It didn't make sense to do it for that. So he spent a day, climbed up, cut a hole in his roof, put these double glazed units in, instant skylights. It's perfect. Cuts down your lighting bill, which again, somebody running the fish room in the UK. Lighting, electricity, heating, it's one of your main considerations when you build that room. Any cheaper form of doing it while still keeping the heating, it's got to be worth considering. And Dave put these double glazed units in. He's, uh, same with me, which I'll talk about later, suffered with algae a bit, the actual flood of natural light. Uh, and so all it takes is a sheet of polystyrene, cut it to size. This polystyrene up here isn't for insulation, it's literally just to keep the sun out. He's got now got the night balance between natural daylight, so we can work in there in the daytime with no electricity being done, lighting wise. And again, the tanks are clear, there's no green water, there's a little bit of algae on the side of the tanks, but it's, it's nothing major. Um, heating. That sort of insulation, it's well insulated. Is it how thick the walls, Dave? Four inches. Yeah. Four inches. Again, it's something I harp on about online as well. I don't know whether anybody's read it. Good insulation. Um, it's got to be. Even now, at this time of year, you can feel the difference in the temperatures dropping. If you're running a fish room in the UK, you're pumping muddy hand over fist to keep more warm if you haven't invested in good insulation. Dave has, and he can get away with running a small, is it 100, one, one kilowatt? It's less it's than that, watt. it's 400 watt, no way it runs under. 400 watt, and for that, you may be running Sorry. 40, 50 fish tanks. No heaters inside the fish tanks, you heat the room, keep the room, the room warm with good insulation. It lets you increase your amount of tanks. If you've got spare space on it, you haven't got to go and source a heater for that tank, the room's already warm. Again, 450 watts, I'm sure there's some Rift Valley tanks and the big tanks that are running almost the same type of heating through individual heater stats. The floor's and no, insulated as well, speak. The floor's insulated as well, yeah. So there's, there's no escape. Once that air's in there, apart from you leaving the door wide open, it's very hard for that air to escape. So you're keeping, you're trapping the warm air, keeps your bills down. All good fish rooms run on the same principle, much like your poly boxes. You keep the heat in, keep the cost down, and as I said, forums are 50 watts. There's reef tanks that are running far more than that just on the heating alone. Um, water changes. It was a bit dark when I visited Dave this time, but what Dave's done different to me is petitioned the front forefront of his fish room and done two separate rooms. The fish room's bit. It's one big shed, 18 foot, Dave. 18. Yeah, yeah. 18 foot shed, he's petitioned the first four foot and put an interior door. Now outside there's a double glazed window in the small room at the front with the main door going into there. You shut that and then you've got another door to open. Again, it's almost a porch. Now all this fresh water is in that porch. It stays warm, but I couldn't take photos of the water storage. You know, it was too dark in there. And Dave's a bit tight and he hadn't invested in lighting in that bit. It's <laughs> light in the day. <laughs> there you go, and it's never there in the day, alright? So, water changes, and this, to me, was ingenious. He didn't go on a system, much like myself, he found the benefits of running individual tanks outweighed a full system of tanks that are all linked into linked. Um, and Dave's drilled his tanks, much like you'd put an overflow in for a system, but on this he's got a tap, a quick release adapter, it's a case of getting your hose pipe, clicking it on the tap, tank, turn the tap and it drives straight off to your drain. Not a lot of bugging about, then you've got a pump that pumps the water back in from your water butts into your tanks. It's a lot easier than the way I do things and it, it cuts down time. So, that's his water chain. He said, oh, air, everything's air powered. You can just see at the top, there's an air line that runs all the way around the room, PVC air line. And 
air valves coming off that, the whole line's filled up with air, pressurised, and you can run as many air lines as you want, depending on your pump. And that'll power your fish room. Sponge filters. And uh, we get onto the fish. Like I said, he's just quite recently moved into killie fish breeding. Not on a professional scale, but there's by any means, but he's doing well with it, the few fish that he's got. Again, more common fish, the more in the killifish hobby, he's not so much a specialist, but a general all around this, and he's enjoying his fish keeping, which is far more important than what you keep, is whether you'd actually enjoy keeping them. And he's doing well. All these pots on the top are all marked up with the species, the date, and they contain a small layer of peat, and where Dave places the eggs on top of the moist peat, keeps them moist, and you're having good results hatching them all out at once. Excellent good results. Yeah. Whereas I used to pick off 10, 15 eggs off the mop and put them in water. They'd hatch in 10 days' time. But in the meantime, you'd have a continuation of fry. No, I found it impossible. I gave up after a while because... 64. So, Dave has started putting them all onto peat. They'll all mature at the same time. They'll drop them in water. They'll all hatch at the same time. He's got a uniform batch. They're easier to feed, easier to look after. I did it hard the way and gave up. And Dave's doing one of the great runs with his killifish breeding at the minute. He's doing really well. Again, are they species tanked? Are they? Yeah, all yeah, the eggs yeah. above the tank, yeah. So there's, all these eggs are from that tank of fish. Um, they're not mixed up. Obviously, you can't mix your killifish up. And uh, he's doing well. Basic tank, just a mop in the corner. The killies are quite happy with that. They'll go in there, they'll lay their eggs. Sometimes up to 40, 50 a day if you're lucky. Sometimes only five or six. But you, you, there's a continuation of the daily spawns. The dwarfs. Like I said, Dave's specialising in cacatoides at the minute. Um, he does a couple of others with his Master Eye up there, Domestic Corner with Master Eye. You notice, which is a wild caught fish, which is really nice. Rock Pumps, Alcalina, with Fry. And th it was only when I got home that I realised that there was four different ways that you could set his tanks up. And, and there's four different ways to explain how you could breed it. There's a different way to breed the same fish, if you like. This one, there's all oak twigs, there's a bit of java moss in there to darken the tank up. You can just see the cave hidden, the cave spawners obviously. And he's utilising natural resources, he'll go around and take the dog for a walk, find the twigs, oak twigs, snap them up, soak them, boil them. After a while they're perfectly safe to use in your aquarium. It's a natural habitat for your fish, which is where they come from, there's jungle streams, overhanging vegetation. Um, He's having great results. Dave's got fry coming over his ears. He's got more than enough. He's, he's doing really well. Same with the McMaster eye. Well, this time with plenty of plants in there. Like I said the natural daylight from the skylights. He's doing brilliant with his jar for moss. They're growing rapidly. It's going really well. Pots. You can breed your pistols in a bare tank as long as you've got one of these pots. They're a cave spawning fish. They'll, they'll tend to gravitate towards that pot where they lay the eggs and be quite happy. And this female there, she was a bit shy while I was taking the picture, but she was guiding a fry around the tanks quite happily. And this one is a load of broken pottery. There's no rhyme or rhythm to the tank, it's just chuck it in, break it up, chuck it in. There's loads of nooks and crannies, and the fish absolutely adore it, and uh, they're going really well. And again, it's angel fish. Doing really well is angel fish. The only downside to breeding angel fish is lack of room. One pair of angel fish can pull something like 2,000 fry per month. It is a vast amount of vast amount of fish. But he's doing well. Limited space, and he's doing well. He's got some gorgeous wild fish. Came from Mark. I think there's some in the auction today. Is not the wild angels? Same as these. You were right when you said there was a pair in there. <laughs> he's got them going well. Uh, domestics. Now I've seen these as fry, they were, they were not much bigger than that when I first seen these fish and within a year Dave's brought these on to be absolutely huge, they're humongous fish, easily bigger than your hand, the body size, they're, they're absolutely they're monsters, they're, never seen angels like them. Um, so as well as doing the wilds, a few of the vessels, he's specialising at the minute in the blues, there's a lot of blue strains which are really desirable at the minute, there's a lot of foreign fish keepers doing a lot of work with the blues. Dave's one of the people in the UK who's working with the blues and 
he's trying his aim and he's got a goal and he's, he's line breathing, he's trying to reach that goal and see where he gets to. So I'll keep you informed on that one, he's a close friend of mine and he's, uh, I'm enjoying keeping my eye on his progress, he's doing really well with it at the minute. Another small plug for the website. Is there any questions about Adrian? Anything? No? You can't ask, ask questions on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Here he is. You find Ray in the back corner. Ray Blackburn. Now, I've known Ray, or known of Ray, for about five or six years now. Your name always crops up in breathing circles. And we'd never really met, had we, so maybe what? Yeah, I know, I thought you know. <laughs> so I got that impression when you turned around and ran off every time I approached. Well, maybe, what, maybe a year, year and a half we've been friends and what a fella. He's a really nice fella. He's old school. You go, you go through raids and he'll phone you an hour later to make sure you've got home okay. He's that kind of man. He's a real nice fella. So, he invited me down, obviously, to come and have a look at this fish room. And obviously he came with a reputation beforehand, and he's got the certificates to prove it. Now, this is Preston and District Aquarius Society. They run a breeders, they don't run it anymore through lack of interest, appallingly. I'd have been on there like a shot out of, this is right on my street. Now Ray was lucky enough to get on this, and, to, and he's reached the master breeders. Basically how it works, you breed a set amount of fish. Fish are listed. Point wise, uh, could be any fish, South American Central Rares, Live Bearers, Tetras, Barbs, Rasboras, and you've got to do a mixture of fish to reach of, of different levels. So you start off with a nice easy fish, you do an egg layer, which may be a cherry barb, which you can spawn without too much trouble. Now, when you get down to this master's breeder certificate, there's a lot of work involved, isn't there? Eh? I can well imagine. I've never done it myself, and I've seen some of the fish on this list. These are the fish that you look in your box and they're classed as impossible to breed or very, very rarely bred in it. If you've got this certificate hanging on your wall, you know you, you know you're in the you're up there. Um, luckily, as I said, I was quite pleased to be able to photograph them and Ray's got it and he can prove it and here we go, this is where we are at Ray's. You go in, it's a Liverpool terraced house, all fairly close to me. Inconspicuous from outside, you wouldn't guess it was a fish keeper's house, there's no poly boxes out in the front or anything else. You go in and you walk into the dining room and this is your first view of, hang on, there's something a bit more serious here, this is, this is it. He's got his dining table over in this corner, this is where all the magic happens, this is the observation, this is, he spends some time here, he, he'll sit, he'll have his tea and he can watch the pairs that he's set up to breed. And these are all dwarf cichlids, these are, it's a, uh, it's a good mix isn't it, in South American, West African, there's a, there's a bit of everything, but these are mainly dwarf cichlids. Um, then you open this door, which leads you into here, which used to be an old building, it used to be an outside toilet, an old Liverpool terraced house, and it's, it's a tight space. But he's, he's absolutely packed it out with tanks and, and what a mixture of tanks is there's absolute treasure trove of small breeding tanks, large growing on tanks, rare fish, common fish, nice fish, ugly fish, everything. You can, you'll find everything in May's fish room, it's a real good mixture. So we've got these small tanks, then we go in, we've got on your right hand side, we've got some bigger growing on tanks. It's four foot, right? Three foot, four foot, around that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but there's, there's roughly a four foot tank. Maybe 150 litres. They're, they're growing on tanks. Yeah, brood of angel fish, chuck them in there and bring them on. And there's some nice uh, dwarf cichlids in there. Again, it's very narrow. It's only, I think the whole room must be four or five foot. Nice, nice mix of space, now, plenty of space for a single person working, a bit cramped when you invite your mates over, but it's uh, perfectly workable. And some ingenious touches as well, we've got obviously the heating, but it's, uh, that, it's also run off the house heating, there's a radiator in there that's connected to all winter. It doesn't affect the heating bills too much, to run a room like this isn't going to cost you the earth, it's attached to the house heating 
when your house is cold, your fish room's like, when you put your heating on to warm yourself up, your fish room's heated up. It's insulated anyway, so it retains that heat. Um, well, we have this back corner, breeding tanks again, some more breeding tanks around the corner. These are small fry tanks, there's a better look there. Just bare tanks, sponge filter in each one. When I got there, there wasn't too much going on, but there's lots of little baby catfish in there. <laughs> um, down below, just underneath there, there's this RO unit, and he runs a lot of RO. Some of the soft water fish that he deals with can only be bred in really soft water. Ray's on the tap, I think we measured it while I was there, didn't we, Ray? Was it 7.2, something like that? The pH. When we tested your pH in your water, what was 7.2? Yeah, 7, 7.2. So the RO unit comes in handy for dropping the softness and dro dropping the pH, obviously. Heating, just a new radiator put in, so that's all right. And just running off this, I didn't get a clear picture. There's a nice little tiny tap just there. Just on a, not only a slow trickle, but again, for rinsing out nets or clearing debris out of your fish. In a fish room, it comes in really handy. It's really nice uh, touch to the fish room. Right, fresh water, just a water header tank up in the roof, it's, it's up right up in the ceiling, the warmest place of the fish room obviously, you fill it up with cold water when you've emptied it, overnight in a warm fish room it'll heat up to temperature, as soon as you want to use that you turn this valve and you can fill whatever tank up you want, it's simple, there's, because it's black there's no way of knowing what your water level is and you're not going to get up on your ladders every single time, so raise drill the pipe clear pipe going up, now your water level is registered on this pipe, again it's the small touches that make a fish room so much easier, it's, it's fairly simple when you think about it, but somebody might be doing that for the first time, after they've flooded the floor four or five times by overfilling your tank, you sort of learn these things and pick these things up. Again, up in the top we've got a big air pump, most fish rooms run these, big air, powerful air pump, Supplies a main line which will run all the way along the fish room. Taps and valves coming off that with your airline, power sponge filters. Again, it's cheap, it's easy. Sponge filters are superb, one of the easiest sponge filters to maintain in a fish room. Whip them out, squeeze them out, it's absolutely fantastic. Heating, again, there's not much more to say than that. In the UK, we're all space heating fish rooms. If you're not space heating your fish room, you must be losing some money somewhere because to me it doesn't make viable sense to buy 70 years.